Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. This is Sports Fanatic News. I'm Joe Boric, and I'm joined by a very special guest, a big-time season ticket holder of our Reading Royals, Ryan. Ryan, how are you doing today? Doing good, Joe. How are you? Doing good, doing good. Uh, Would have been better if we got the two out of three other than the other way around, but, you know, we'll get into that on this edition of the Royal take as our Royals fell three to two Friday night, won by the same score they lost today, five to two on Saturday, and then oddly enough, uh, lose five to two on Sundays or two games by the same exact score. Um, what were your thoughts on this overall weekend? Uh, one name I'll just throw out there and people can have their own reactions to it in any way, shape, or form is Shane Harper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people in my section, 124, were yelling, Harper, you suck <laughs> all weekend long because he would destroy us. I think he had three total goals this weekend against us. Yeah, and one was shorthand. Yeah. Two, we had two we had two shorthand goals this weekend, which that's not good. You can't, we can't have that. No, I think, I think the shorthanded... The fact that the Royals, that's something, too, like the game against Trois-Rivières, obviously they lost 10-4. to um, This was like a couple weeks ago now. But that game was they were on the power play and then just gave up three shorthand. I don't think I've ever seen that happen in my entire life of watching hockey, where even McNally said that <laughs> in the booth. So, like, um, I, I don't think that that has ever really happened, um, where that's been one thing that I will say needs to tighten up for going into the home stretch and you can say if you agree or not, but into the home stretch of the postseason is you need to also, even just because you're on the power play doesn't mean you don't play defense. <laughs> like, like if you're on the power play, you've got to be able to get back and, and stop the other team's counterattack, which I have found it hasn't been a problem most of the season, but in probably seven or so games, there has been a handful of them or more that you're like, okay, you can't have that happen in the first round or the second or you can't like that can't happen in the Kelly Cup playoff. Oh, I agree completely. I know early in the year, like I want to say since early February before this all shorthanded goals, we gave up like one or two, which was like least in the league. Now we gave up, I think seven or eight, something close to 10. Yeah, it was literally, yeah, you're actually, you're right. Actually. I didn't even think about it. It was like this ridiculous, um, just uptick because of the basically just because of struggling all of a sudden and having those last moments, which that happens in the course of the season where we saw it at the start of the season. Cause I remember the, the press conferences after the games would be, Oh, we had a three, four minute, five minute lull period that we kind of just shut our brains off. And then that's how the other team, whatever team it was in that instance came back in this game. And Fridays kind of felt like those a little bit because you had up to nothing Friday, played very perimeter, played a little bit cute. And then Ebbing even used the word cute today uh, for being a little bit too cute with the puck when I asked him about it. So um, I think those two, it's just about getting back to what we had since the beginning of the season mentality of use your skill, but also just use the strength and brute force you guys have at driving to the net to the pure effectiveness, which is what makes this team how great it is. Oh, I agree. Like you said, like Evan said, we they played cute with a two goal lead on Friday. You, we can't do that's something that this team does a lot. They play play in defensively and they shouldn't do that. They should keep on attacking. Because like we saw it Friday, Iron came back and won. Yeah. Yeah, and they I mean that game also obviously you can't do anything about a freaking puck getting put in front of the net off of, I think it was, was it, I forget who shin pad it went off of, but a puck that came up, went off of a shin pad in front, and then in, I mean, there's not much you can do about that. They basically, as Kirk McDonald kind of said, they basically essentially scored on themselves. <laughs> like, like for the game, for the game winning goal, um, uh, which is usually something that's reserved for soccer. Uh, every now and again, not hockey. Uh, but let's move into uh, a good game, which was obviously the game that took place on Saturday, of which uh, Frank the Tank Pachara was able to get it started. Trevor Gooch, uh, as everybody says, Gooch. Gooch. 
Brad Morrison, and then our all-star, Jacob Pritchard, was, of course, able to get the final goal. That game, to me, was we played and put the tempo high immediately, like Friday, but never, even in that lull period, they responded very quickly from that middle lull period. Morrison got the fourth goal, and then they never looked back. Where Friday, you never saw that response as much, and that's why Adirondack was able to finally get that third goal. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I think Teixeira's goal, having like less than four minutes into Saturday's game, and that, that definitely lit a spark in the arena. Because I don't know if you saw it, Friday, at the end of the game, Kirk was yelling at the referees, and he eventually got a game of misconduct. So yeah. Frank is yeah. just like, let me set the tone early with that goal. Yeah, you can tell Frank, I mean... I think Frank Deshar is a primary candidate. Braden Lowe is also somebody you could throw into this conversation, but to be a coach after they stop uh, playing in the ECHL because they both have the minds of just analyzing and knowing exactly what to do and exactly that, which is obviously something you want to have as a characteristic if you're a head coach. So uh, I think both of those guys definitely have that in their future, especially Frank, who you could tell, and Braden, both of these guys are so connected, not just to the team, but to the city at this point, that every loss is not just a loss to them. It's like, a, damn, like, <clears throat> what the hell happened here? <laughs> like, it, 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 you can tell it really, that's why I think this team has such good bounce back, honestly, because their leaders are so accountable. It's like, this city is so blue collar. We're so like, they fight for us. We fight for them. We got to get this back. Can you hear me now? I think it broke up for a Yeah, sorry about that. I had a few, I knew that was going to happen. No, it's all good. But, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know if you – don't you think the leadership group on this team is the main reason we haven't seen any skids, really? Like, you had some lull periods in the season, but I think having great leaders is why you don't go into losing streaks. Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely, like you said, guys like Braden Lowe, Frank Cachera, Thomas Evans, who's been with Kirk McDonald for two, three years. They know his style. They can teach younger guys like Cormier, Vykov. Even Trevor Gooch has been who came back after J- the COVID shutdown. That's the reason yeah. why they all have A's on their jerseys. No, yeah, exactly. And then um, I think I think when it comes to the team, as we wrap up on and then we'll go into who's impressed us the most this season and what we think the keys are for the home stretch, I think it's just this is simple, as we said it before. You shouldn't obviously lose three out of or two out of three, excuse me, to the Anirondack Thunder, who are in last place in your division in your home stadium, albeit as well. But this is hockey, and that's the way as Kirk McDonald likes to say a lot, shit happens. Um, so, yeah. like, you you um can't always control stuff. The puck, you didn't play the best closeout game, but the puck goes off of somebody and you essentially scored yourself on Friday. On Saturday, you get a fortunate bounce that ends up on Morrison's blade for that fourth goal, so it goes the other way. And then today, it was, you started off pretty hot, seemed kind of like the feel of a three-and-three three game, and then they kind of got the momentum from having too much sloppy neutral zone play and turnovers in the own zone for the Rivera goal. Uh, so I think it's just about how this team's done all season, just get back to the basics and just trust. Like, they, they never strayed away from trusting their system, and I never see this team doing that because they got great coaches and they have such great leadership that this is all to them. And you can tell from how Ebbs was in the post game. So they're already moved on and saying we got to do X, Y, and Z for Tuesday, Wednesday to beat uh, Wooster and get back to where we want to be playing uh, the game that we know we can play before. Yeah, hopefully they use tonight's game as a like a fire under about to come Tuesday because I can remember the last time this team lost two free games in a row. Especially a team like we have Wooster coming up who we've dominated here this season. Yeah. That's a fair. Yeah, they have they have played the real um, really good where um, I'm looking now because I brought it up because you brought up that point. 
December 21st, we beat them 2-zip. Uh, January 7th was 3-2. Uh, January 8th was 6-2. Uh, in Wooster, 6-3 the 14th. Uh, two to one, they did beat us in the fifteenth, but that's one game. Um, so like you were saying, like they they played Wooster five three. We beat them on uh, March fourth, which of course at the end of this month. And then three two was that shootout game uh, mm-hmm. that they won on Wednesday, March second. So they played in any way, shape, or form. They found ways to beat Wooster. So I agree with you from that standpoint. I I think they should be able to take two of two this week as long as they play exactly how they did Saturday and keep that intensity up. And even if they have a little lull, they immediately get it back and don't have it like today where like they kind of just shut off a little bit and then couldn't get it back. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And definitely say, I think we should say, I don't know the number off the top of my head. I think Worcester has a really good power play this year and our penalty kill is not that great. So if we can say out of the box, which what do we spend like team? We used to penalize team in the league, so that should help our case. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I think I can't remember the stats, but I do remember going over them with one of the people for one of the sites I work for. I believe you're. I believe they are one of the better power plays in terms of their scoring output. I think they score more of their goals on the power play and look significantly better that way than they ever do five on five. So they're definitely a team you don't want to put on the power play for that reason too. They're basically. I'm trying to think of like a team that you could, but basically like some years that the the uh, Islanders are in hockey in the NHL, where like this year, for example, they suck and haven't done that great. Where if you put them on the power play, though, they still got Brock Nelson for the world and all these guys that can piss you off in front of the net. Wooster has just kind of the same thing when it comes to that. Yeah, but yeah I think now- these two games coming up. Real quick, you don't move on. I think these two games we could should see like maybe a potential playoff preview, there's a good chance we could see Worcester in the first round of the playoffs if they slide the fourth in the playoff standings. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we're right now, uh, before we move on, actually, I'll do, we can do a standings. You reminded me that's not a bad thing to do. I usually do those every so often, uh, do a check-in on the standings around. Obviously, for us, Reading's in first place, Newfoundland's in second with point six five seven. Uh, to a 0.679 percentage. Wooster's in third, and then TR uh, is in fourth. When it comes to the, uh, here's the Wally. The Wally have a 0.698 win percentage. They're in first in the central. So that's a 0.698 to a 0.679. So yeah, our, our Reading Royals are definitely not too far off of first place in the league if they can catch the Toledo Wally. Um, I think I think that should honestly be the. I think this team is always driven by like the fact that they know how much like they talked about the fans throughout different courses of the year and how much they admire playing in front of Shotgun Day Arena and different pressures. I don't think I think they feel they're going to be playing Toledo in the finals if they get there. Mm hmm. That's why I think they're also going to be able to bounce back from kind of this crap weekend quickly because yeah. they want first place. They don't want to yeah. be playing you know, in Toledo to start that series. They want to be playing Toledo and set the tempo in Reading and then go to Ohio and then yeah. be able to already have hopefully a lead in the series at that point and then kind of just put a stamp on it and not have to worry about starting in Toledo. So that, that drive in itself, because I'm just thinking of like if I was a player in this instance, that would even – like, I don't care that we're in first place in our division. I'll be like, let's yeah. get first place in the damn league. So if we get to the final, we're playing in our home barn also. Especially with our home record this year. We're like, besides this weekend, we're really good at home this year. Oh, yeah, yeah. The One of the best. They're either the best or one of the top three best home teams. I can't remember the stat. but Yeah, and we have two games in hand, so hopefully we'll catch them. Yeah, the one game... I think we're supposed to play. I don't know if Toledo's supposed to hit 72. Right now, we're supposed to hit 71 because of the one non-rescheduled game between Adirondack due to the fact that they couldn't fit it in because right. they might be able to fit it into April if they really want to, though, for standing purposes because we do play Adirondack again one more time. So it will yeah. be interesting to try to fit that. In. I, don't, I don't think they will, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll have to see. But 
now we can move on to the fun topics, which is talking about the stars of the team this year and who we think are not just the stars that we knew probably coming in. We like to have a chance of having a great season, but the guys that have really stood out and impressed our eyes this year. So those that's always the fun guys to start with. So I'll let right. you go uh, first on this one, Ryan. Nate, give me like two – we'll start with two people. Who are like two guys that you didn't think coming into the season would be as fire as they are, basically? All right. I know one guy we talked about before on Twitter, Kenny Housinger, for sure. Yeah, I, for I, sure. Yeah. I, like I told you. Like I told you before we started, I didn't think he was going to make the team out of camp. A little 5 9 forward, but second, he's on our second line. And he has, I looked at his numbers earlier. Before January, he only had four points. Now he's at 28. So Kirk sees something in him, and he let him go. Yeah, and I think what you just said there, too, is the most important thing when it comes to having the best success as an athlete. You need to find the coach that gives you the most confidence where you just said it there. Kirk, even when he wasn't producing the highest point share, saw that there was extra gas and he knew there was a lot more there that it was just once he got the points churning at that point, he wasn't going to look back and he was going to be the guy that brings the jam and energy every night that also scores rather than just the one side of it, which it was the first half of the season, the second half of the season, it's the best of both worlds basically, uh, with Kenny Hausinger. And yeah. he's essentially became your smaller, um, like, I don't care about the, well, Hayden's not the biggest guy, but I think he's six foot or six one, but your smaller, like, personality of, I don't care who's in front of me. I'm still trying to get to the net, and I'm still trying to create, which is exactly the, the obviously game that Hayden Hodgson played. So Kirk McDonald likes having guys that fill the, I don't give a crap about anybody that's covering me, I'm being me mentality. And it seems like he found that guy this year in Kenny Alves. Yeah. And our guy said that to me, Trevor Gooch, we talked about him earlier. He, remember fans, he wasn't on the team in the beginning of the year. He was overseas in Italy. He came over in December after we were shut down a couple weeks for COVID. And he's st- fitting like a glove, 25 goals, which leads the team. Yeah. Yeah. Gooch, um, I think everybody was happy when he returned uh, since he was, of course, here before. Then, as you said, went overseas and then I was back with Reading. And I mean, no matter who you put him, Mo Pritchard and Ebbing now this year emerging as his career year are like guys that you could put them with anybody on your team. And the line's going to look not nine or eight out of ten times really good because those guys just know how to get the most out of the other two or three players around them. And uh, that that really goes a long way when when you have four or five even uh, of those guys that really pull the most out as guys that are not as experienced as the Braden Lowe's and Frank Dacharas that we know are going to always be the guys that get the most out of guys um, from not just playing but leader perspective. Would you have those guys that add into that group too? That's what makes it really disgusting. Just like that's why Toledo and Reading are so disgusting because they both have a bunch of guys that can do everything. Like that can play defense, score, um, block shots. Like that's why both teams, ha- probably in most people's eyes, are the favorites of the matchup in the championship. For sure, absolutely. But for me, mine is. I know we talked about him before. Uh, Morrison, because we saw it. I remember it was when Dylan was still there, uh, and I talked to him after the game about it. Where the can't remember who we played. It might have actually been Wooster, but he made that ridiculous move that he nutmegged a couple defenders and then got stopped by the goalie in the first game he was in. Um, mm-hmm. And once I saw that, I'm like, okay, this dude's gonna like, like, like this dude has it. He just needs to start getting the point share going, and he'll be good. And it was like the first couple of games he didn't really score. He was feeling himself out. And then as soon as it hit, it hit like a ton of bricks. And he was the best scorer in the entire ECHL and just was on a ridiculous, like, I think it was like 1.3 something points. Per, like it was a ridiculous pace. And that's why he, of course, ended up getting a chance to play a game with Phantoms and then came back down um, because he was just on this absolutely otherworldly pace. Uh, which he still hasn't really gotten away from. Uh, be, uh, he's still been ridiculous uh, the whole entire uh, season for the most part. 
Oh, I agree. I, I, I'm liking Morrison's play on that top line with Gooch and Bykoff. Those three have really good chemistry. And I, when we first had Morrison, I did not like him at first since he started out slow, zero points in his first seven games. But now, like, as he said, he took off and showing why he's here. And he, even though he's a younger guy, he's definitely a vet, veteran. I think he's like 26, 27. Or, 25. I think 25. Uh, he might be 25 on the dot. Let's see. I think you're... Yeah, 25. 25. Mm-hmm. He's a funny guy, too, Brad. Brad's a character in a good way. And I mean that as a compliment. Like, he's a funny dude. Like... One other guy that stood out to me earlier, I'll mention a guy I know you talk like a lot, Mason Millman, sent down from the Flyers, actually. And this kid's only 20 years old, and he's really impressive. Yeah, especially since last year, which is kind of odd that the Phantoms play the system they play and for some reason play guys that have been in the league for eight years in the AHL more than guys you're trying <laughs> to develop. But it's – but it – he definitely gives the Royals a benefit, so I'm not complaining from that perspective because Millie, uh, Kirk said it about him in post game. He thinks he has the potential to be an NHL um, level defenseman. Uh, where I think the Flyers, you don't know, usually pick a guy in the fourth round if you don't think he at least has some chance to eventually be a third pairing guy or something like that and work his way up. Usually that's what the, six, the fifth or seventh rounds are reserved for, just getting guys that might turn into something. Usually the first four, at least in my opinion, you're trying to actually get guys that have a chance, to, a good chance to at least be something for your NHL club. But what he did yesterday's game is exactly what he needs to start doing more because we know Mason Moment can pass, obviously, as a, but his shot is really good too, where when he gave it back and then he did the give and go and fired that one-timer on Saturday, uh, that's, if he starts doing that more, He's not going to be just a good uh, offensive defenseman. Well, actually, not just offensive. He's a good two-way defenseman. A good two-way defenseman, he's going to be great because his points are going to go from, like this year, at 17-24 games. It could go to 24-24 and 24 games because if you start shooting as much with that shot, then you might have, the like, eight goals with your 12 assists or something like that. And, you, and then you would have, in the 20s, of points where I understand as a defenseman, sometimes you would rather – be the guy to get it to the forwards to shoot. But if you're a guy that has a cannon, I don't think the forwards are going to care if you're the guy scoring in the end. Yeah, I think that'll come in time. I think hanging around guys like Patrick McNally, who's also a two-way defenseman, can learn, he can, he can learn, to, learn, yeah, learn a thing or two from McNally, Mason. No, I completely agree with that, which is also, we have to remember, one reason our defense didn't look as sharp this weekend, actually the biggest reason, is Cormier got loaned up and Patrick McNally's injured. <laughs> well, right. if your two on paper best defensemen are injured, well, not injured, one's up in Lee, not in Lehigh, up in uh, uh, Laval. Yeah, yeah uh, Laval, yeah, Laval, thank you. And then the other is injured. Your defense most likely is not going to look as good as it usually does. That just makes sense. Um, yeah. Even though we have very good defensive depth, it still affects the way things are played. Uh, guys that don't have the exact chemistry with each other then have to play with each other. So it does it does still change things where that's the other reason why this to me is that this weekend was just a bump in the road because you didn't have your two best guys in the back, in the back end. And that's going to obviously affect you no matter who you're playing. For sure. I mean, Kobe deserved that call, but it hurt us this weekend. Oh, oh he 100% deserved it. He, he started breaking out. Um, what I love about him, because he's actually somebody that we could throw into the category of a great surprise player. This is his breakout season. He finds a way, like obviously Kirk McDonald stresses, which is a very key point hockey. Don't just throw shots in the net aimlessly. But he has found a way now, early in the season, he would sometimes do that. Now he's found a way to be the guy that I think is the best at finding a way to get it through traffic. Where, like, I remember I asked Kirk about it the one time, and I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said, like, yeah, he tends to just be more strategic now in terms of choosing when to fire it on with guys in front, and therefore creates rebound opportunities or deflection opportunities. Where 
that's a lot harder than it looks because some people think, oh, he just fired it on that point through a bunch of guys. That's not that hard. Well, no, to make sure it doesn't get blocked by six guys that are standing in front of the net, that's a little bit harder than it looks. So <laughs> I think that's what I really like the most from Cormier. Uh, he's so good at just getting it to a deflection level spot for somebody or a rebound opportunity for his teammates by getting the shot through the traffic. Oh, I agree. I think he played forward for one game earlier this year because we had somebody here get called up or hurt last minute, and he was really impressive. So he's can play full forward and defense been for us, I think, down the stretch. And then Chen played forward uh, last week, like 10 days. Remember he scored that goal in the game, the one game he played forward? Yeah, he scored yeah. that goal coming up. With us. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty. That was pretty. <laughs> um, so, I, th- I mean, versatility, this team's full of depth and versatility, and obviously – as we can uh, move in now to our keys to the home stretch, I would assume depth and versatility is obviously a huge key as you're heading into the home stretch of the season. Absolutely. Especially with this stretch now, we have games Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Those are big games. And you need guys like Jared Brand, who I know you're impressed with lately. He needs, he's he been impressing me lately as season progresses. Yeah. Brand. Rand, I just like because he's a guy you notice when he's not on the score sheet in a good way. I should I should specify uh, where when you notice a guy in a good way when they don't even, where lately he's actually been getting assists, but that's beside the point. Uh, yeah. Like makes the hits, he blocks the shots. Like he's the fit. He until we just brought on Will McFadden and then obviously Garrett Cockrell hook lay on the body. The the Royals before they brought back Cockrell. They really only had Brandt as the big, like, let me drill this guy into the neutral zone. Area. Like, where now you have the Will McFadden kid you just brought in. Uh, you got Garrett, and you obviously have Jared. That that adds an even bigger component for down the stretch, because obviously in the postseason, you want even more physicality than you do in the regular season. And having three guys on the back end that can bring that, rather than just one like we had at the beginning of the season, Obviously, goes a long way. Yeah, and I saw Will McKinnon had some physicality. I think Friday, so that was nice to see from a new guy. Yeah, yeah, I think I think Will McKinnon. He impressed me a lot on Friday. Today, I think it was he got a little bit too energized. Like there was a couple plays today where he looked too energized playing, where he would like go for the hit, get caught. Like the one play that they almost had the opposing rush going the other way, then luckily Adirondack lost it at the beginning of the neutral mm-hmm. zone, and they were able to get it back. Like there's some things. Obviously, I think he's a 21 year old kid out of New Hampshire, so like he's a guy that you're going to have to give him. Kirk even said you're going to have to give him time to to ingratiate himself into everything, and you have to kind of calm him down a little bit, it so to speak. But I think over time, from what I saw in his first two. He has the makings to be a very good defenseman. It's just about calming down the basically everything he does and don't do everything a million miles a minute, basically. Yeah. Yeah, this week was his first pro game, like you said. So what the he's out of the way. Hopefully he'll step up this week coming up and maybe we'll see Shane Seller make his pro debut. Yeah, I would have to think uh he'll be thrown in as uh one of these games, especially with how many games we have in continuum. Kirk does like having the ability to rest. Uh, give some guys some blows so they can be the most fresh out there, which is also a very smart thing to do, which not enough coaches do. But uh, well, not enough coaches also have the depth to do it, but we have the depth to do it, and then he takes advantage of the depth to do it. Um, Seller, Seller, I think, will be an interesting guy because, Kirk, this is how he described him, um, where he's not the best skater, but he's a – very intelligent kid plays the game really well and thinks the game extremely well where when I heard that the the, the guy that that reminds you about but not to the same effect because I'm not saying anyone I'm not trying to put the pressure on this kid to be one of the best players <laughs> in the league but the guy that he that that mentality reminds you about is Winnie because Winnie was never the best skater was always to think the game better than others in order to be one of the best centers in the entire well, he still is, but in order to be one of the best centers in the entire league. And that that when he said that mindset, I was like, well, I'm not comparing him to him because Josh Wimpers is the best center in the ECHL argument. But it's more the mindset of 
that you might, like, you're not the best skater, but you're still going to be in the right spots because you think the game a step ahead and you're very intuitive. That was Josh Winquist to a T, where if you can even get a B minus version of Josh Winquist and Shane Seller, that's a very good thing. Yeah. Like, yeah, and I also think of Matthew Strobe right away. He wasn't a good skater when he first came here two years ago, but now he's up in Lehigh putting up really good numbers. And I give k a lot of credit for that. Both him, Strom, and Seller have size at 6'3", so get, getting a big body out there will help us for sure. Yeah, that's a good point, too. Yeah, I didn't even I didn't even realize. I, I didn't realize he was that tall. So, yeah, that, that even helps even more so to get another guy that can bring some uh, extra physicality into the uh, fold in the postseason, as we talked about when it came to Will McKinnon and uh, Garrett Cockrell with Jared Grant as well. But I guess now as we're – kind of in our last uh, few minutes here, what would be in terms of, I know you said you had a couple written down, but your three main keys um, to why the Royals were as good as they've been this season and what you think is going to continue to keep us successful as we head into the downstretch of April 16th, I believe is the final. Yeah, it is. I think one thing that's really helped us this year is we have a team mostly of ECHL guys. You don't see teams with mostly ECHL guys with this much success. I mean, we have... McFadden and Morrison are on AHL deals, and Millman's on an NHL deal, and that's it. The rest are ECHL players. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point. And then uh, Carrillo is on the Uzi NHL deal. Yeah, 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 the NHL. And Nagel, NHL. I forgot about Nagel, my bad. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, and Pat. Pat. One of the three Pats. Um, yeah. But... Uh, the he had a it was cool today. He had a moment with this kid after the game. That was a cool thing to see. Um, but I think I think like you said, uh, I so I know you said it before the show, and I'll turn it over to you to talk about it. But the biggest key to me is something you brought up that you wrote down about Kirk, which is his eye for talent and scouting. No matter if it's from the Hockey East, from up in Canada, Acadia University, whatever. Uh, he's very good at picking different guys out that fit different roles. Uh, like, like what, what's all your whole side of that? Because I know you had that written down as your key, how good he is at developing guys, and just how good he is at scouting guys. Yeah, K-Mac definitely learned from learning from Larry Corville, who was our coach before, of recruiting. Like, Patrick Vykov comes to mind right away. This is a guy who had really good numbers in Greenville, and he's really, I think he has 20, like, he's up there with 20 goals now on our top line. He's cooled off a little bit, but I think he'll search again. Yeah. Yeah, Bykoff, I mean, he... He's a guy that sometimes, I think, gets too caught up in being nice instead of just shooting the puck. Like, like he has one of the best shots in the entire league where there's some guys at certain times you're like, I appreciate how generous you are because you're also a very good passer. But don't. Well, like, I don't need to score. I've scored enough in my career. You have a great shot. You shoot the damn puck. Like, right. Like, where um, he's been great the entire season, and I think that's why, because nine times out of ten, he tends to have that shoot mentality. Um, mm-hmm. This weekend, I would say I did see, but I saw that with everybody. I feel like Friday, Saturday, or Friday, Sunday games was a weird, like, not as shoot-oriented games from like it started with a shoot oriented game on Friday then it went away after the Anirondack started coming back and then on today it really wasn't just it wasn't the biggest shoot oriented game kind of had a feel of a three and three where the Royals tend to always have been every game I've watched this year if you have an opportunity to get it through traffic you're going to fire and net to give yourselves an opportunity this weekend we got a little bit we've used the word earlier in the podcast overly cute or overly not passive, but to played outside too much. Which mm-hmm. So I think for me, one of the biggest keys and adding a guy um, like Shane Seller might help with that because, as you said, he's 6'3", is continue to just do what Kirk McDonald says. Be as skilled as you can be, but also be as brute as you can be, like I said earlier. And that would kind of be my closing thought because my that's what makes me love this well, I love the team in general, but like this is what makes me love this team to the whole degree because not and I haven't really seen many teams in any level of hockey that are really good at having guys that are very skilled, but a lot of those same very skilled guys don't give a crap about their own well-being and will drive to the hole 
to get a goal to the net as well. You, usually teams have one way. It's like you're really skilled or you're a very good net driver that has the ability to score in front. You don't have a lot of guys that are both. Absolutely. For sure. But I don't know if you had, um, I do appreciate, I really appreciate you and thank you uh, for joining Ryan. I hope to have you on some time again, but I don't know if you had any closing thoughts um, into what, how your outlook is for this week and the rest of the season. Um, just hopefully, as of course, it's like hockey. Don't nobody hope, hopefully no one gets hurt. This stretch of eight games to 10 games is tough for anybody. So if we can get out of this unscathed, I think we'll be good. Yeah, I do agree with that. And then somebody somebody I did want to throw in that I think could be a secret weapon, so to speak, scoring-wise in the playoffs, um, that I do always like his shoot-first mentality. And I asked him about this the one time I grabbed him for the postgame is Gags. Uh, Anthony Gagnon, if he can just start scoring at a higher clip, he's one of those guys that seems like once it starts going like this, it's yeah. just going to keep going for him. Because he has a hell of a shot. It's just sometimes he, the goalie gets that like elbow save. He gets it up there. Uh, and um, he's very good from that one-timer spot on the power play. That's why like, I feel like he's kind of their – he's obviously not a secret weapon because he's played a handful yeah. of games. But he's not the guy that you would first game plan for. That could still really hurt you if you're a team in the postseason. Because if you leave him open, he has one of the best shots on the entire team, even though he's not one of the pr- primary points producers. Yeah. Gagnon is a guy. I like, I like his shot a lot. I know, I know he missed a lot, like I think like four shots wide, but when he finds the net, it will most of the time will go in. Yeah. Yeah. And also I, I don't mind. I mean, if, if you're going to have the shoot shooting mentality, I would rather have you keep that and miss the net than, than get too nervous because you missed the net. And then stop shooting. So I, I admire the fact that he kind of has that almost basketball mentality in hockey where it's like, well, I'm a shooter, so I'm going to shoot the damn thing. Uh, instead of saying, well, I missed the net two times. I shouldn't shoot now. But you never want to think like that. So I really appreciate the fact that he thinks how you should, which is I'm a shooter. I just need to shoot. it, uh, And that's a very smart thing for him to do. But I, again, Ryan, I really appreciate you for uh, joining this has been the latest edition of the Royal Take. Hope to have Ryan on again. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to uh, share um, with anybody going out? Or- uh, no. If you just want to follow me on Twitter, at Ryan Bizarro, B-I-Z-Z-A-R-O, you can see me tweet about the Royals a lot. Yeah, I would recommend that because Ryan tweets a lot of really cool things about the team, and not just the team presently, but you throw in some stuff about team history on your Twitter as well, which I like following. So I would definitely recommend following him if you want to not just know about the team presently, but about cool things that Ryan tweets about the history of the team as well. But again, thank you for joining us, everybody. Please continue to subscribe down below or up above on the easy-to-use widget to keep us growing. This has been the latest edition of the Royal Take. As we recap the Royals weekend against Anirondack, previewed the games ahead, and talked about who impressed us this far and what the keys have been this far to this heck of a season. Peace out, everybody.